Mary, thank you so much for allowing us into your studio. And we have you on a photo up there where you are in your real studio. And yeah. tell us a little bit about, about where you are right now and since when you have been there. Because, of course, we see that it's not your, your actual studio. So tell us a bit about where you are and how, how you're feeling there. Um, I'm in South Africa. I'm here with my boyfriend, David Altman. He's there. And um, we're in a farmhouse. We're in an alley called Hemel and Arda, which is heaven and earth. It's gorgeous. Um, I came, I mean, everybody's story having to do with this uh, global pandemic, I imagine, is, uh, is um, <laughs> unique. So uh, I came, and even when I think about it, I came March, I left Los Angeles March 4th. And um, I'm sure if I was to leave even a week later, I would have maybe not come, but it seemed like, uh, I remember we're gonna talk about my show that's at the Tang Museum. I remember watching on the television and now I feel so stupid. I mean, I remember seeing COVID happening in Wuhan and thinking that's over there. Like so many other things I had seen is over there, Ebola, SARS, MERS, so over there. And I didn't have that feeling that, um, I even talked to a friend of mine who studied epidemiology and he said something like, oh, it's gonna be like the flu. So I came, it started happening, and um, here I am. And we were in Cape Town, and uh, we just wanted to move, move to a spot that was outdoors where maybe I could work and um, you know, have, have some space to work, which I have a lot of art supplies with me. And, um, that I bought. So interject with the question if this gets boring, but uh, yeah, so I got to Cape Town and that's how I met. I went to the beaches immediately. I love to swim. That's how I met Zolani. I just love to swim and everybody knows that. And uh, um, South Africa in lockdown, are you allowed to go to the beach? Is there a lockdown? No. No, it's 100% lockdown. And the interesting thing about South Africa that people might not know is that um, they just crushed the curve. They had 100 cases when the UK had 100 cases. And the UK, the curves went like this, and then the UK went up, and South Africa just bent over like a knuckle. So it went up and then across because... Um, the you know they're very in in tandem with the World Health Organization. The present talks to Bill Gates and the thing they just completely closed it to the point where you cannot go outside, you cannot walk your dog, you have to stay inside. And then the other crazy thing that just is an added thing that that's odd is that they banned the sale of alcohol and cigarettes. If you can imagine no cigarettes and i guess that's to keep people from going to the corner store unnecessarily but you can go to the grocery store you can go to the pharmacy but i wrote down how many how many cases i mean there have been sort of very and now my post-it has gone somewhere but very few deaths something like um very few compared to thousands and thousands in the uk and so they bought themselves some time and I listen to the news reports all the time of you know, how they're thinking about it so um, uh, carefully, you know, because of course here there is you know, great disparity in, in the way that people live. You know, in California, I was listening to now Gavin Newsom is teaming up with Motel 6 and we're trying to get the homeless people into the Motel 6s. I mean, here they can't do that. Yeah. So yeah. lockdown definitely till May 1st, this very strict lockdown. Um, they're opening a bit of the corner stores, but uh, so that's why we came out here, like I think the day before so that I could 
you know, at least, you know, we were an apartment, so at least walk outside. And yeah. so now this is on a farm. I can walk around the farm and see the cows and the chickens and baboons and there's some great birds in my there'll be some paintings about this. <laughs> All the different animals. That would have been my next question. Do you, in a moment like this, do you use a moment like this more like to reset and to reflect? Or you said you brought a lot of material, you brought paint and canvases. Are you actually, can you work? Is that something that, that helps you through the day? Well, uh, I went to the art supply store in Cape Town. I came to, to Africa with the idea of not working at all. And in fact, people said that to me, oh, you know, aren't you gonna work when you're away? I said, absolutely not, no, 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 because I had finished all my work for the year. I have a show, suppose, I don't anymore, but I have a show at Kagosian opening June that was gonna go all summer, a big show that I've been working on for three, three or four years. Then I have a show with David Kordansky, which hopefully we can still have in September of the drawings all the works on paper i made in japan and so the 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 year was full the retrospective opening at the tang the show with larry gagosian then the show with david kordansky then the sh then a show that my my <laughs> show at the tang was supposed to move to santa fe and then a show in aspen it was the fullest year i could possibly imagine so i was going to take this vacation and see animals and meet people and listen to music. So I get to hang out with, I talk to, you know, what do I do? I just talk to David all day. That's great. That's <laughs> great. You seem like in one of David all day. Have and, you then, and then I watch the news. Who doesn't? And you know why? Because I don't want to read about it afterwards. I, I, I keep up with it completely in real time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I watch all the press conferences from California, New York, all over, and South Africa. Just, you know, I read a lot, yeah. Do you make drawings or take pictures or do you, do you have like a diary with notes or something? Do you make any notes, visual notes or verbal notes or you speak on a, on a, on a recorder or how do you capture the time? Um, that's an interesting uh, question, Klaus. I mean, I think that uh, I have, um, I think I have a great capacity for what I've learned is I and 999,000 other people signed up for that Yale course on happiness. I got through like a couple of, uh, a couple of, you know, videos and I quit. I'll pick it up again, but the second video, she talks about the the professor, it's the most popular course ever at Yale, and she talks about savoring. She talks about savoring, and I, I've i noticed, after she talked about it, I thought, well, uh, oh, I do that. I have a great capacity for savoring the somatic moment, and I've thought about this, like why, uh, how can I paint these paintings and why am I able to, and people say, do you make sketches? Do you take pictures? Do you take notes? No. It's just that as something's happening and it's extraordinary, I think about it. I go, aha, this is it right now. And I have, I could tell you these, you know, when I was telling you about the baboons earlier in the cocktail party, I mean, that's a painting. I mean, it was just so beautiful. And when things like that start to happen, sometimes I wish I were a filmmaker. And I have a lot of things that I've remembered that I think, oh, I have to, re when, when I'm a filmmaker in another life, I will return to this spot and take this shot because this is great because when i take it with my camera it's never the same it's terrible i will ask you about the baboon paintings the baboons that you first thought were birds i think that's 
that's a beautiful transition perhaps into going into our more formal part because yeah. you and your studio were kind enough to give us provide us because i think it's important to understand how you how you are and where you are right now but i also think even in times like this i think it gives us the opportunity perhaps to spend more time in looking at what we think we know already many people know they know your work i always think i'm familiar with your work but every time i speak to an artist i learn more so i think for me it's the opportunity when we are all more focused perhaps for for this conversation because i've been to your studio last summer we know each other we we we, we see each other but this is a moment where it feels like it's a little bit like being on pause and I'd love to look at um, to look at your work. So perhaps we start the slideshow. One first question: I there is a great review of this show. There's a great review of your show in Art in America, and Stephen Westfall, and he suggests very much in the beginning of your career, and that's also what I think the title suggests. Um, um, Kenyan Daisy Eden, that say that you are, and you just mentioned this when you described you on the farm and you saw the baboons. That landscape and nature is a very important point of departure for you, which is surprising in in a way. It's not the first thing I think people, when you look at the early target paintings or so, or when you look at your current work, it's not the first thing people would associate with you with. Do you want to say a little bit about this? Or you can also say, well, that's a wrong interpretation. But I, I kind of like that thought. Um, okay, so uh, I was trying to concentrate on what you were saying and what the, the sort of or question is there. And I think, uh, what you're saying is even with this installation shot, which for for people that the two kind of uh concentric circle paintings are from 1989 1990 and so the so you're wondering like it does that have something to do with nature yeah is that yes so so the way i came the 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 origin of the idea for those concentric circles was um and this even has to do with i mean nothing in this conversation gets discounted right i talk about i'm reading about what's going on now because i don't want to read about it in a history book so i'm very interested in in history and so these were um the idea came from uh it's the Hitchcock film where um, uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy Stewart is is in the is in the in the forest with I think Kim Novak and there's a tree that's cut in half the red in the redwood forest and in the redwood forest there's always a split tree and then there are bits of history that are marked off and you see like oh the Civil War this different important things and you can see how the tree has gone through periods of drought or um a fire or uh you know nice weather and it occurred to me that that a, a, a person is like that that um cities are like that uh, nations are like that 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 the outside is sort of you don't really see what's happened but it's a reflection of of everything that has happened historically so these are certain timelines where one thing happens it pushes another thing happen it pushes another thing happen and um so that was the idea of those was from uh, a, tr a tree cut in half because i think you know i probably saw one when i was a kid in the natural history museum and then also the redwood forest so I had this idea of portraits that were like 
a portrait of a person that was like a history of a person. Yeah, that's exactly what I, that's the most beautiful, most poetic answer because I would have not guessed. And, and so I'm showing a couple of installation views from the Tang Museum, which is a, I don't America calls it a tight, but really, really well chosen retrospective of your work, starting with the late eighties. And that was wonderful. You mentioned to me that uh, in the late eighties, you had a studio at MoMA Pierce One and the great painter, Rebecca Quaidman, was actually the curator who worked with you there with Chris Derkon, showing these slides. Well, I, well, Klaus, I wish I had a studio at PS1. I did not. You know who did was, um, okay, sorry, mind freeze, I can't remember. But um, I had a, uh, a project room, just an exhibition in one of the classrooms, but it was a huge, huge honor and i was quite young and i had my own project room at ps1 and i showed these circular timelines there in january of 89. that's amazing um when when you have a show like this i've done so many retrospective with artists and artists normally get very sentimental or nostalgic about a retrospective, some also get slightly depressed because they feel like now my life is over, I had a retrospective. With you, you are so young, it's a mid-career survey, I would not call, let's call yeah, it a mid-career yeah. survey. It's a little bit less dramatic. Yeah. How do you feel seeing so much of your work basically, um, that's basically 30, 30 plus years of your work? How do you feel about this? I, how do you feel about having 30 plus works in one room? Well, I feel good about it. I mean, that's such a simple answer. I just, um, um, well, um, I, I mean, I can look at all of these paintings and remember uh, what was happening when I painted them. So I don't keep a journal, but to me, it's, um, I mean, when one looks back over one's life or it's, um, you know, isn't it a combination of, uh, it's bittersweet, right? It's a combination of uh, of happiness for a life well lived, but also, um, and I guess that is a life well lived. If I I uh, would want to relive it, you know, that was that was fun. Oh, you know, man. I can look at those paintings. I can look at those paintings. And because there was so much searching involved, you know, it was, and, I, and I've always raised the bar for my work. And that's why it takes on so many different um, formats. There's so much searching involved. And, um, and I can just look at every single one of them and say, oh, it's, I mean, I've picked out my favorite paintings. So these are the ones where I felt good, like, oh, I, I, that happened, this happened. The, you know, yeah. we can talk painting by painting, but um, I mean, I think that Bill Arning and uh, Ian Barry, who um, organized the show, asked me that same question. And it's sort of like, how do I feel? I mean, I mean I th I'm in a place in my life where I, I feel good about myself. So it's like, I hate to almost get out of the present moment. I mean, I. Yeah. I left that, that such a, I like how grateful and appreciative and how in the present moment that, that, that is, it's not like becoming, it's not past, it's not the future, it is, it's like right now. I wanted us to look at this picture for a longer time 
because I did a studio visit with you. Um, I did a studio visit with you in late May and you were just getting ready for the shipment and everything for the tank. And you had chronologically put all these works that we are now looking at. Remember I was there late May with, with our friend Adrian and you had laid worked, out. You had laid, worked on oh, long time. Yeah. yeah. And you had laid that out chronologically. And that's basically what I thought we should do today, going through your different bodies of work. Uh, you, you originally are from Ojai. You have lived in Los Angeles and San Diego. Then you went to Princeton to study. And then after Princeton, you applied for the Whitney Independent Study Program, which I think is always, for me, uh, an indication of, of doesn't matter if you are a photographer or a sculptor or a filmmaker or a painter, it, it conceptualizes the work very much. Very much, yeah. It was the mid 80s, so you were in New York in the mid 80s then, Whitney program. What were you working on when you were in the Whitney study program? Uh, the timelines. The timelines, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is interesting because I've never really said it that way because uh, just like, oh, the timelines, but because um, that makes me think of uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres in those timelines. But I was somehow, um, I was, uh, I was interested in the, in, in, in time and the, I was reading, I was reading The Voyage of the Beagle, actually. Um, do you know this book? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about my interest in nature. So for people who haven't read it, it's um, Darwin's voyage that then he bases uh, um, origin of the species on. But um it's just a log of what happened to him on the boat. And he's a very young man. He's in his 20s. And, um, oh, for example, they get off in um, South America and they're walking through sand dunes and their little stubs sticking up out of the sand. And they pull on them, like pull on them, and it comes out and it's a glass root. Glass. Yeah. And it's because the lightning has come down and struck the sand and disseminated into the sand and comes up as this, this glass root. So I was thinking about time and how things develop and I started making these circular timelines. So I had a compass. I was living in a one room on the upper west side, tiny little studio apartment. And so I had a very small compass it was about this big and I had little pieces of paper and I was making these concentric circles and then painting them with gouache and I was making many 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 of many of these and um yeah that's what I was doing Klaus yeah that's so that's so generous to share this with us I wanted to ask to rest a little bit on that picture the detail from the tank show the installation because I wanted everybody to be aware that these paintings often in slideshows you don't see what's monumental and what's more like a miniature what's small what is human size so i wanted to have this slide be up for a long time because there are works where your sister margaret is 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 in like i don't know if you see them here right in the middle there's a photograph with there are the paintings with the sponges so some of these works are very intimately scaled using the original also found object like shells and stuff and others are quite monumental so i think what we should do now is go a little further and go chronologically further because i thought it was so incredibly uh revealing when you talk about here we might think about kenneth nolan we think about jasper johns nagasaki of course we think about the abyss of, of warfare. Um, Frank Stella comes to mind. Um, 
And you were basically saying these are also time logs, like you cut a tree and you have the, every year has a ring. So um, recently I read more and more that, that critics, even also Stephen Westfall in the, in the um, Art in America calls you a feminist painter. He calls you, calls you that also in, in relation to these paintings, because of course you took on um, certain male superheroes, masters in quotation, that is a word we shouldn't use, but at the time when you took them on, I think people would still speak like this. And you create oh. these, these large works here. Well, that, it was like, you have to, um, Klaus, you'll like, if you can just roll back, um, roll back your memory to that time. And um, the significance, I'll just touch on what Stephen talks about in that article, the significance about being at Princeton at that time in terms of thinking about art history was that Rosalind Krauss happened to be at the Institute for Advanced Study. Rosalind Krauss was working on her essay. Will you remind me of the title, Klaus, that was about reproduction? Yeah, it's coming, right. standing on my yeah. own. Yeah. I, I have essay. And she was starting to think about, um, and she, she wrote about Sherry Levine. Okay, so for those of you who were not, uh, thinking about it yet, or for those of you who were. The essay the time, is the originality, originality of the avant-garde. That's originality. it. Originality, yes, yes. So, so I became interested in, and you will notice this runs through my work. I mean, sometimes when you're, I think when you're a young person, especially in your teens, 18, 19, 20, you hear something that impresses you and it just goes in. And then it, it reads through the work in ways that uh, an artist doesn't even realize. So I became interested in doubling. Um, that's something that Krauss wrote about a lot. I was so impressed with um, this lecture, which led me to you know, get a subscription to October Magazine and um, but what I wanted to get to was Sherry Levine and Sherry Levine re-photographing uh, Walker Evans. And at that moment, understanding, because I had learned the word feminist from my friend Esther Sademan's mother in San Diego. And Esther Sademan's mother was the first feminist that I met. And she had a subscription to... Um, Mother Jones, and uh, Esther told me that her mother was a feminist. Now, I still know Esther's mother, I still know Esther, and I, I think that um, when I heard that word and I heard what it was about, I knew even then, like when I was 14, 15 years old and the 70s that I was then a feminist. How could I not be? And it's been interesting as the years have rolled by to see how that word has gone in and out of fashion. And so I always thought of myself as a feminist artist. And at the time, Sherry Levine was re-photographing Walker Evans. And I saw that as a kind of end game, you know, a kind of, I can't go on, I'll go on. And so I thought, well, this is a master, these are masterworks. And then of course, uh, Louise Lawler, Cindy Sherman, Barbara Kruger, Jennifer Bolandi, uh, Gretchen Bender, I can go on. Of all the women that were working outside of the area of painting, that were showing mostly at Metro Pictures, which was, um, is a gallery that still exists, but it was uh, in Soho. There was, uh, 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 okay, I'm st stressing my memory too much, but the women that were getting a lot of attention 
at that time were working outside of painting. They were working in photography and installation and video. And I thought, um, what's the next feminist move that my job, and there were women that were making big paintings. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that was like um, so Susan Roth. So you're uh, describing a little bit of pictures generation around Metro Pictures, which is of course related. And then these were artists you were at the time there, perhaps like 10, 10 to 15 years older than you are. So you were basically already um, very aware of these because that was the time where they really made an incredible change in how we look at it. Right. So I was aware of their work when I was 21 or so. I mean, I came to the New York, I was in the Whitney program. And so I was like very aware of all this like great critical work that was going on. But I thought, okay, what can I, my job then, what is my job would be to like go back into the arena of, um, of large scale painting. And um, that's what I did. I just so, pulled out so the, scale, the large, the bigness of the paintings was part of the the project to begin with. I just pulled out a painting here, like Violetta from 1991. This is a little yeah. later than the targets, and you talk about monumentality. I'm going a little bit further in showing more of these paintings. That one's 10 feet across the, yeah. if you, the 5 a.m. one. So these are all very large mm -hmm. paintings. Back. Yeah, that's why I'm showing them because the sheer mon monument monumentality is it's incredible because you were not when you had your big Gagosian show in 2018, that was not the first time you had these large formats because you're returning to a monumental format that you had like, nearly 30, 20, 27 years ago. I mean, I probably always would have made these giant paintings if I had always had a giant studio. You know, the recession of, uh, God, the first, you know, it kind of goes up and down. You get a big studio, then you have a small studio, then you have, so the, the work, when I have the opportunity to make a big painting, I do. So there were times when I didn't have a big studio. Her clairvoyance. That was a time where, I, where your titles are very uh, narrative or nearly operatic in a way. Well, um, you know what's really interesting is now everybody, well, okay, I won't say everybody. I'm like, okay, now there's a thing Go about ahead. pronouns, pronouns, right? But what I was working on back then were, were pronouns, where I was trying to talk about the self. And if I say her clairvoyance, I was, it was playing around with the difference between my and her, and you see her clairvoyance, but if it's pointing back at me, if mm. I make a painting called her clairvoyance, is it about, is it a self portrait? Is it, about someone else. It was never really about anybody else. Mm -hmm. Here in a piece, like I pulled this out of the slideshow, Deliverance, of course, the, the starfish, the, the found object that you put in, of course, basically reveals the dimension of the painting. And I think this is a very important uh, characteristic of your work another piece here from 94. So this is, I had a, I was working in my um, apartment in the East Village. I lived on Third Street between A and B. If you can picture that, it was uh, NYPD blue often shot in my foyer. And um, so these were made in quite a, a small studio, but um, the transition between the silk screen and the and the gluing on objects that I had just gotten tired of going to the silk screen studio and getting the screen made. So I thought, well, what if I glue the object itself on? You know, so then then the collages got more chunkier when I was using actual objects. 
And this is, uh, this picture is called Missing Margaret. And it was a, it was just a photo. I, I, I took a portrait of my sister and it is just cut out like this. And in the work, there's oftentimes this theme of uh, transformation. And it happens in Frida Kahlo too, where the body becomes the earth, becomes like, which is almost like an Ayurvedic thing. Like when I'm thinking about the baboons on the hill, you know, the one baboon calling to the others and they come down the hill like this, it's like that could almost be a personal interior process when one could call to one's own baboons, right? And do you understand where things, that the world becomes the self and the self becomes the world. So the head becomes a butte, the butte becomes a head. And then this is like the two Nagasaki paintings with the, the face that's pale and dark and above and below there, these themes of day and night above and below the seen and the unseen, the hidden and the revealed that are constantly running through the work under above, above the horizon, below the horizon, above water, below water, in the heavens, on earth. And then I find myself in a valley called heaven and earth right now. <laughs> this is a very large painting that's kind of, I think it's more than seven feet tall. And you have this figure that's nearly life size, night and day from 1996. Um, I mean, a lot of them, the titles are, um, like, I find them almost comical. There's this grieving woman and the kind of weight of the universe, which that, uh, pink orb above her could be the moon, but then there's a moon set into it. So then the positive space turns negative. Because if you took away the moon, then it would be the moon hanging over her. Yeah. But is it the horizon or not? And so this kind of dropping through into alternate universes, but this grieving, and it's a kind of grieving that's like for, uh, you know, life is so, there's so much bliss, but then there's also so much um grief you know in any you know we do, we don't we don't escape it so that other one night and day isn't there that song that goes like night and day you go to my head anyway and then yeah, it's a total loop yeah yeah any cat stevens song which i i hope is sort of funny you know if you listen to any cat stevens song it's that's how you feel. <laughs> so I'm going uh, a little faster through some of the other works now to arrive at here again, big, big red Margaret head. Going a little faster through the slides because I would like to arrive a bit more in the, here you have another small work with the shells collaged in. I would like to talk a little bit about this work because sometimes you, you refer to Klein, sometimes you refer to um, Yves Klein, Franz Klein, Yves Klein, both of them actually. Um, this seems to be a premonition of a work that you later come back to. Do you want to say a bit about this work and then we, then we basically go into the mid 2000s and we go around let's say 2010, perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting because the, in, the, in the survey show, we don't have, we have one cave painting. So again, in terms of this flipping, this day and night, this uh, can be seen as a shrouded figure, right? It's called absorbent, so um, a grieving figure. And then, so, it's like, you know, in Alice in Wonderland where she cries so many tears, like it fills up into a lake and then she swims away. 
So this, I thought, well, there's this, this uh, grieving, keening figure. So I'll put these sponges on it to soak up the, the tears of this crying. And, um, but it also is a head or it's a figure or it's a cave. So it's got this theme of this shape runs throughout. Yeah. This I made in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's a very important biographical information that you also moved back to Los Angeles from New York. Yeah, I moved in the summer of 99. So here we have beach. We have another yellow day. Another yellow day, that's kind of out of Camus, you know. The sun was shining in my eyes. I couldn't help it. I had to kill him. <laughs> Just showing a couple of works from this area, Midnight Toker. But you should go to Midnight Toker because I have to say, you see, that's the anthropomorphization of the, if you, I can say that, of the earth. Yeah. So in this painting, Earth is smoking a joint, getting high, looking up at its own moons, and there are multiple moons in this painting. So it's the Earth contemplating the sky. While, while smoking a joint. <laughs> yeah. You go, go a little bit further, just in the interest of time. It's so fascinating to hear you hear town and country. It's so fascinating. So the one that went by, I think was called Untitled. That's, those are the Twin Towers. Hold on, I'm going back. That yes, was, that was painted on the day I was listening to the radio. What else could I? What else could you do that day if you weren't there? Watch the loop on CNN. Watch the loop on TV. Yeah, yeah. And this is why I um, let's go back to the twin towers one more time because that's what I said. I would love to go through those paintings with you because often, of course, you are referred to as an abstract painter. And I asked you about nature. I asked you about figuration and. I think you talking about this as the Twin Towers is exactly why I wanted to, um, to talk about these works because I think this is incredibly also generous of you to share this, Town and Country 2002. But I want to talk a little bit about this because this of course has, uh, again, of course, nature, but it also feels like the painting with the sponges, like the very early on, um, when I first saw that painting, I thought about Bryce Marden, which is, of course, perhaps uh, because that's I, exactly that's exactly what I was thinking about when I made this formally, of course. Yeah, and then yeah. And that's the first because you, of course, you make us think about Kenneth Nolan, or you make us think about Stella, or you make us think about Eve Klein, you make us think about. Um, and then you take it and make it your own. And there is these figures with a red color and it becomes very nearly sexual and very sensual to perhaps use a slightly less strong word. But I think this is something that going, er, going further to your later works that is even in the abstract works, I think a very, very strong night painting we will, I will, I know that you don't want to talk about it, but I will ask you about Bakersfield when we get there, timing wise, but I think these are important. For me, it's so interesting, an artist find form. That's Point Doom. Yeah. We were talking about Paradise Cove. Yeah, so here is, I show that again. You go back, that's Paradise Cove. Then we go to Point Doom. But I think your abstract reference using a motif that is so concrete like Point Doom, but then calling the painting after Hodler with the choice of colors and this very, um, not volatile, but there is a very chore chore choreography in, in how you apply the, there's this really a movement in them. I'm going one further. Georgia. 
Okay, so this is yeah, um, Roger, because I think this is a very important point. So uh, that's okay. Elaborate a little bit on this. Um, well, we don't have a lot of other uh, cave yeah. paintings, but I was, I, was, I started uh, drawing from life, and the first thing I started drawing was Point Doom, and. Um, so I drew the point, the point doom over and over and over. I made a lot of paintings of point doom. And, and doom is very dynamic. Dynamic when you say after Hodler, I think for me the Hodler is not only the color, but it's also Hodler captures always a movement. It's dynamic. There's a tension, it's in midst of a move. And strangely enough, after Hodler, the point doom, there is dynamic, but you're not painting something that would move. And I think this is quite interesting when you come to a painting like here, Georgia, where you capture a before and after, which makes it, I think, more dynamic than if it was, um, if it wouldn't have that, that, that movement in it. Like, okay, so, so the reason, like for me, the reason it's called After Hodler is because of the paintings of Lake Geneva. So I read that Hodler made thousands and thousands of drawings on site of Lake Geneva. And then he brought them back to his studio and made the paintings. And that was the way I was making the, um, like, so for me, it was like referring to the process that I would go to Point Doom, make the drawings, bring them back, and then make the paintings from the drawings because I couldn't paint on site. And I'm just... I, I'm very interested in these artists that paint, um, you know, so Georgia O'Keeffe would, or even Cezanne's very famous for that. Like, what is that, the mountain that he paints over and over again? Mount Saint Victoire, right? I think. So, anyway, is that what you were getting at, Klaus? What yeah. is the, this about the movement that you're talking about? I think it's about movement because it becomes nearly cinematic to take a picture over and over and over again. It's like a stop motion. It's like different in terms of the weather is different, the sky is different. I think there is a certain the time captured in it, in a way, if you do a certain motif over and over and over again. I went to the studio where you have, I actually went to the place where you look at the mountain and I went twice and it looks so different in, in terms of even during the day. So I think there is a dynamic notion in doing things repeatedly. And perhaps when we talk about this work, Georgia, and then go, go to 2012, I think there might be... Um, this is the transition, yeah. Okay. So... If I just talk about Georgia briefly in terms of doing something over and over again, and I want to bring it back to the present, yeah. which is my intention is to travel. Now, when I'm tra if I'm traveling, I see a certain place at a certain uh, time of year, and that's the only time I've ever seen it that way. I mean, I, I mean, it's the only time I've ever seen it. So say if I visited where I am now, today, I would have the impression that there's a warm breeze, there are high clouds in the sky. But the strange thing about the good, the interesting thing about being in lockdown is that I'm here in a certain place and the season is shifting. I'm getting to experience the change in seasons. And I'm starting to see the fall colors come out. So this cave that I went and sat in front of and drew is on the central coast of California. And over the years that I drew it, um, when I first found it, the sand was very high and the cave was smaller. And then I came back after one season and the sand had gone way down and then the cave had a rocky bottom. And so it was, I got to know this piece of landscape very well. And um, I mean, I worked on that for a, uh, a long time, starting in 2000 and, gee, 
I mean, it was a long time. I want to say 2005. Yeah. When I say dynamic, I, I used to another word before. I used the word finding form. For me, it's always, because I'm not an artist, but I'm grateful that I'm in the privileged position of following certain artists over decades. And we are looking here at nearly three decades of your work. So finding form and the dynamic movement of works. When you were just saying you did this over certain years, I think when you, and let's now talk perhaps about Bakersfield, because that is what I asked you when I came to the studio. Um, I think it's not, you are not coming to a different form when you start, when you got invited to Bakersfield and you spent five weeks there. It's, you're, you're just finding continuously more form because I think, for example, after Hodler Point Doom or Georgia are very related to how you then continue when you have this um, studio time, this production time in Bakersfield. And perhaps it would be nice if you could share a bit with us how you, you were invited there and how your observations were like of the city and of course the high desert and the lights there because I think that's where I'm getting. I'm getting into this finding form that I see this more as a continuation rather than a new form. But that's of course my view. You might have a very different one. I'd love to learn about it. Um, no, I, I think that um, I'm just struck by this uh, phrase of finding form. Um, and then also, um, the good thing about having this uh, survey is to see all the collage work and see how I've been messing with the surface of the painting for a while and pushing things together and sort of my love of, of the sculptural and the, and the interruption, right? So, for those who haven't heard the story, just the short version, because it was very odd, these um, mm, kind of, I hate to call it even a breakthrough, but I was invited by a friend of mine named Joey Cotting, who's a terrific artist, and he, was, he had a teaching job up in Bakersfield, County Bakersfield. And uh, Joey had invented a course that was five weeks long. And he would invite an artist, they would arrive and in Bakersfield and work with a class of students, maybe 20 students, and they would conceive of an execute an exhibition in five weeks. And the reason Joey came up with this idea is because he uh, worked for Kiki Smith. And he thought you can go to art school all you want, but working for an artist is where as an artist, you can really learn how to think about things. This was his idea. And uh, so he said, well, Mary, would you like to do this? And I was very happy because I had not been offered a, a museum exhibition of uh, any kind since 89. And I wanted to make an exhibition on a large scale. And I had been thinking about place and this is going back to my training at the Whitney, Whitney program, really. Like, I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to go to Bakersfield and bring sea caves to Bakersfield. It has nothing to do with Bakersfield. I want to make a series of paintings for the city of Bakersfield, that people in the city of Bakersfield could understand and like. And my experiences there were, you know, I guess I should write them down because they um, 
there was one night I was painting and I was, they gave me the, the exhibition space to paint in and it was, the heating worked too well. It was winter time. So I had to have the doors open and the, cause it's a Cal state, the police patrol were state troopers, right? So one night this sheriff guy comes in, I said, oh, so he's like, oh, just checking. And I, you know, I was painting late, maybe midnight. And I said, look at, uh, are you, we started talking he was around from around there. I said, look, you're from around here. I'm trying to, I'm naming these paintings. You know, I've been painting these. So the Bakersfield paintings, based on so much having to do with, you know, when we were, I was ta showing you those Any Cat Stevens songs, like, before I even started, Klaus, there's just so much, it's hard to explain everything. But when I think of Bakersfield, I think of the grape You make me drive to Bakersfield. Remember when I visited in May, you said, oh, I can't explain it to you, you have to go there. I went with an Uber, so I can jump in at some point. Oh my God, that's amazing. I mean, Bakersfield is so important because, because I mean, this is what's going on in California right now. That's why, you know, Gavin Newsom calls himself a nation state. But, you know, the Central Valley feeds the world. Not only that, the Central Valley thinks it says like, we are to California what Texas is to the United States. You know, Bakersfield is a very specific and special place. And, uh, but physically, you know, and I, I think about the people that came during the Dust Bowl. I researched the Dust Bowl. I mean, I really, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't study the Dust Bowl in high school. I didn't study the Dust Bowl in college. Study the Dust Bowl, that's a tragedy. You know, there was this idea that rain followed the plow and we plowed up the Great Plains. And you know what, it quit raining and it went, and that dust went up into the air and that dust would go as far as New York City. At some point there was, it was they said there was as much dust in the air as could fill the Panama Canal. People were dying of, uh, you know, pneumonia from breathing in the dust. And so, the work has always tried to marry this kind of history. You know, there's this interest in history with like the present moment of the color of the sky, you know? And so the Bakersfield paintings had so much to do with the color of the sky in the San Joaquin Valley, but then kind of combined with the history of the place. And so the simple explanation is that driving around Bakersfield, there's a lot of neon, there's a lot of neon there because they've never replaced it with LED. It's just still there. And um, the sun was setting, the lights of the city go on. And I thought, ah, I'll put, I'll put one of these lights in the paintings and I'll make it like an impression, like, say if you're driving and you drive past a sign and you don't see what it says, but it's going by in your peripheral, peripheral, peripheral vision. And, you know, I don't like to repeat myself, but it's the same. I've wanted to, you know, how do I make paintings? We're going back to history. How do I make paintings of people's lives? And then I start, then I start realizing like the lights going on, like, the earth seen from space, you see the lights, you see the lights of the city. Yeah. That and, is, uh, yeah. That is when you make me go to Bakersfield and basically have this high desert, deserted desert, no pun intended, but perhaps I took what you told me in May also a little bit too literal because I always now after I know I see this and I put up Gloria here and I'm showing the next one, 2018. It's titled after the year, showing this one. For me, and I know that you told me that this is actually something else we're looking at that's actually not abstract. 
but I'm not revealing this unless you do it. But I always see in them really nearly the air filled with dust. Sometimes air with dust feels like a, a solid material that you inhale, as you said, you got pneumonia by just inhaling it. And then it's like a, a cloud out of little dust particles. And then this electric, very electric um, flickering in it. And when you do your studio visit, you have this little touch electrical device that you make the, the tubes glow. So I think... Yeah. This one's I, called... Butterfly. Oh yeah, you have that down there, yeah. I like this painting a lot. And you also, I go one back because I think this is such a strong painting. I'm going one, one more back. Oops, that was front. Yeah, that's it. That, that belongs to the Museum of Modern Art. Very happy about that. That's uh, like formally, that's after Gauguin. Like that's, this is different, but Eden, the previous one is definitely uh, Logan colors. Yeah, I want to go to one more that you showed me in the studio. Hold on, it's after Gloria here. This is this is basically also this dynamic move that I wanted to describe before. So I think we talked a full hour, you and I, and I think we still have 32 participants who we didn't lose despite the fact we went into really looking at painting and talking about painting, having different opinions. And I hope you don't mind if I sometimes um, kind of like ask, ask things that you know, many people know, but then I think hearing it in the context of like such a such a chronology that is like a survey informing what you talk about one painting informs also what what one might think about another painting so i think that was incredibly generous of you so a huge thank you to you mary thank you thank you for such an incredibly uh insightful and generous opening up talking about your work. I think that's, I can only thank you.